Hi everybody, hope you're doing marvelously well. We're big, we're bad, we're back, and we're dressed in black for another Thack Friday. So, Eric's just handed me all these questions here to go through. I couldn't help but notice this one. Is this Sheila wrote this, yes? Or did you write this for <laughs> Sheila? It says, why does Eric rock so much? Is it that amazing hair he has? Team Eric. Eric. <laughs> oh, no. Come, come on, El Camera. I think. Look at this amazing hair, you see. Oh, yeah, wait. As bad as my hair is, is as good as. Look at that. Look at that. It flares. Now, <laughs> we, we travel a lot to places to do like video shoots and master classes. I mean, we travel a lot. How many? We've been to a lot of countries together. Yeah. Yeah, um, Eric's done a lot of traveling. And he's coming out to the UK in, in a few weeks. Get your passport sorted out. It's lapsed. I remember the first time I ever traveled with him, he traveled with this huge bag. Just, you know, huge bag. And I remember him opening it up, and most of it was like hair dryer and products and stuff like that. So there's a reason that hair looks that good. So if you, Me, I wake up in the morning and go, and my hair's done, as you can tell. Eric? First way, we've shared many hotel rooms. Not beds, just hotel rooms. Twin beds, I promise. And I'll always get up first, but when we're waiting to go and running just a bit late, all I can hear is... So there's a lot of love that goes into that hair. A lot of love. What did, uh, what did Mike Ledeau call you? Oh, Herrick. Herrick. But in all seriousness... Yes, Eric does rock. Eric is um, the glue that holds it all together. Um, Eric can film. He can edit. He can engineer. He can pretty much do everything. And he can film like on a stand. He can run around and do stuff. He does B-roll. He, I don't know. He's, he's a master of many things. A master of many things. So round of applause for Eric. This is what you have to overdub. <laughs> yeah! One crowd noise is here. Team Eric. All right, so great question. Glad we got that one out. How do I control bass frequencies throughout the mix to keep the boom down so it translates between different devices without sounding too much like garbage? Not the band. I love garbage. Low end is probably the most misunderstood, badly taught, quite frankly, things ever. I think we have like eight videos on low end, and all of them have like 100,000 views. It's a very, very heavily searched subject. There's lots of tricks I do. I use multiband compressors. So what I might do is like take the low end of any instrument that you want to define the low end, say the bass guitar or a bass synth, especially on bass guitars because the bass player, when they hit too hard, can fret it out and actually the low end disappears. They go high, the low end disappears. So what I like to do is boost low end. I use our bass a lot. I'll boost the low end, but then I'll put a multi-band after it. So that's the way you can do it. You can boost the low end so there's a lot coming in, but then control it with a multi-band or a dynamic EQ that gets into those frequencies and just controls the low end so it's more consistent. I think it's really, really important to have consistent low end. Um, it's something I think is woefully taught sometimes. When I first started doing online education stuff, I went into a lot of the different academies and stuff like that, just to find out, it was literally only for a couple of weeks, just to find out what people were teaching. And I realized low end was not being taught very well. And it's probably because it's one of the hardest things to master, hence your question. Really for low end, you need to tame it, but don't make it tame. I just mean tame it, like control it. OX sound, they don't actually have it default to the low end, but if you shift everything to the low end on OX sound, that can be really good. So Soothe 2 can do it as well. It's maybe an expensive way of fixing it. Mac DSP makes an amazing, what, MC 2000, 3000, 4000. Their multiband compressor is fantastic on the low end. That's the Mac DSP one. Everybody makes really good multiband compressors. So what I do is I boost the low end so it's consistently there, and then I compress it with a multiband so it stays even. And no matter where the bass player is playing, it should always give you an even amount. Then, of course, I have no problem with high passing it gently at about 60. I'm not talking about taking everything out below 60, but just slope it away so there's not a huge amount going on below like 40, 30, just a 
trace amount. And then I licked the bass drum, the kick drum, kind of bloom between like 60 and 40. You know, and, and that way those two things can sit together. I also have no problem with cutting a bit of 80 to 100 out of a kick drum. Yeah, unless I'm doing a higher pitch kind of disco kick, I will pull out a little bit of 80 to 100. I've been teaching that now for a few years and I've noticed a few people are starting to catch onto that and teach it as well. It's a great idea to get the bass so it's still blooming in that 80 to 100 area and feels fat while cutting a little bit out of the kick drum so they don't interfere with each other. Then as far as electric guitars, I have no no problem with 150 and 200 being really defined on electric guitars. And then pianos, similar kind of thing. Depends, are you being driven from keyboards? Are you driven from guitars? Depending on where you want to go, you can cut those around each other. Um, as long as you haven't got too much build up, it can get a little bit ugly at about three to 400. So don't get too boostastic around there. Just use your ears and make sure that you've got enough definition. And the most important thing with low end is don't believe all the BS that was flying around a few years ago about don't high pass, do high pass. If you high pass, you'll get more low end than if you don't high pass. I've shown it many times in videos. This idea that high passing is bad is a fallacy. All the biggest mixers in the world will high pass because when you get a lot of low frequencies that are slightly out of each other, like this from different instruments, you don't get more low end, you get more mud and you get phase cancellation and you don't get that full rich low end. So high pass, create space and make sure you have consistent low end in the other instruments. Like with electric guitar, sometimes if it's a big heavy guitar, you get these booming notes that just explode. Put a multiband on it, control it. And then they won't get that huge boom. But then when it goes thin, you'll also be able to have more low end come up. That's the great thing about using a multiband. It's fantastic on instruments with uneven low end. Will the quality of the interface, let's say a cheap one, affect the playback, thus the monitoring of the mix? I understand that preamps will, but what about the other way around? I think cheap is cheap. I do think that we're in an incredible world now where sort of the entry level at, say, 300 is gives you incredible results. Now, you're all watching this, those of you that are on a really low budget and say, Warren, entry level is not 300. No, it's not. Behringer and many other companies make devices sub $100. There is a marked difference between the sub 100 and the 300. We've seen it, lots of people have demonstrated a quality difference. And, but once you're in that $300 price range, gee, the $300 interface these days is about as good sounding as the $10,000 interface of 20 years ago. It's incredible where we're at now. Everything in what we're doing is just getting better and better. We interviewed Steve Klein, the studio designer, the wonderful studio designer, and the video has got to come out soon, Eric. And he said that your average like five or $600 speaker is as good now as an $8,000 speaker in the 80s. Yeah, he said it. And I believe him. Guy's a very smart guy. He's designed many incredible rooms in Los Angeles, for instance. And we're at that place now where equipment is amazing value for money. So yes, I think that if you're in the very, very lowest reaches, there are some marked differences in quality when you're at the really, really cheap end. And so yes, playback can sound not as good at a sub $100 unit, but God, if you can spend $300 and choose one of the many amazing entry level products at 300 bucks, you're going to get such a good result. And yes, preamps do make a difference. That's why we do love the audience range. Their preamps just seem to, well, they win loads of awards because they sound great. I would say 90% of what you hear recorded on this channel is done through an audience preamp unless we're demoing some other great companies because we just have one sitting here ready to go because we want you to hear what it's like, no matter how expensive the microphone is, using an affordable piece of equipment. That's where everything is now. The quality is unbelievable now. What are your thoughts on choosing specific instruments for a given product style? Product, I presume you meant genre. Um, what are my thoughts on it? I mean, it's huge. I mean, it's defining. You know, if I'm doing a heavy metal, heavy track, I'm not going to be using an amp that doesn't distort or sounds terrible with a pedal in front of it if I'm trying to drive it. I'm going to be using something that's really quite massive. And it just comes down to budget, obviously. You know, an EVH amp, even though Christian's not a big fan, sorry, Christian, is an amazing heavy amp. 
And yes, I know it is the sound of so many people's amps these days, but you know, we just had a great um, interview with Dave Friedman and he was talking about, you know, he worked with Eddie for years. He was talking about how that sound is a definable sound of heavy metal. It's just so good. So if I have access to an amp like that, pretty amazing. There's a lot of incredible virtual amps now that are just insanely good that will just reproduce massive tones. But if I wanted to do a funk track, I'm not going to go and use one of those amps, am I? I'm going to use a DI probably if I just want that straight into the console sound and then maybe bring up a 1073 kind of, you know, plug in inside my DAW and just kind of get that plugged into the Neve sound straight away. Or I might use something like a twin or some Fender amp that's pretty clean with a bit of verb if I want to get something a little funkier. But I'd probably start off with the DI, to be honest. So product choices are huge when it comes to genres. Definitely, yeah. I mean, if I'm going to do a country song, I'm hoping a Telecaster would be the way to go if I want to have some chicken picking. There's just kind of things that make sense. Now, with all that being said, because all of this is very obvious, I'm not telling you anything you don't know. With all that being said, the best music in the world is made when you do a crazy juxtaposition of all kinds of different things. When you take a heavy guitar and stick it in a pop song, it works. You take a funky guitar and put it in a heavy song, it works, it twists it up. I, I mean, I miss those days when people took risks. So yes, Maybe you have something that's defining in a certain genre and where 90% of the instrumentation is exactly what you'd expect, but then throw a twist in there. That's how great music is made. That's how all of the greatest bands that we admire made great music because they were taking different influences and throwing them in and doing something really incredible. Thanks everybody for watching. I hope you really enjoyed that. Big round of applause to Eric Von Derrickson, the man, the myth, and the hair, and the legend. And uh, yeah, we're very, very, happy to have Eric on the team. He's been with us now for nearly 10 years. Is that correct? Yes. 10 years. 10 years. Poor guy. He's 29. He's been with me since he was 19 years old. So thanks, everyone. Please say hi to Eric. Leave any comments and questions down below of any future Fact Fridays. So long, farewell, a wiedersehen, au revoir, adios.